Welcome to Electro Online. In this video and many to come after this, we're going to spend some time talking about the Schrodinger equation. The equation that we use to describe the motion, the energy, the position of small particles. And as we have learned that small particles actually behave more like photons than they do like real particles, so to speak. They have wave-like properties. We need an equation to describe how they move, how they react to forces around them. And so Schrodinger came up with his equation, now known as Schrodinger's equation. And we're not really able, neither was he, able to come up with some derivation that says, here's the equation that describes the motion of small particles. There was no such way to do that. He had to kind of go on a limb and make some assumptions to the best of his ability, knowing what they knew at the time, and we can do no better today, in trying to compare how particles behaved and how photons behaved. And sometimes that boundary kind of becomes very, very gray. And we sometimes took some liberty as saying, well, if a photon works like this, maybe a particle will work like that as well. Or if a particle works like this, maybe a photon will work like that. And quite often when we made those analogies, those analogies ended up being correct. So in the same spirit, Schrodinger came up with an equation to describe the motion of particles. So here we're going to kind of take a look at the very generalization of what the equation should be like. And then over the next several videos, we're going to develop where that equation actually came from and how it got to be the way it is today and how we then use the Hamiltonian to describe the motion and the energy of these particles. Well, we begin with the concept, of course, that particles have wave-like properties. So there's a very thin line between photons and particles. So we came up with a wave equation. Well, we didn't. Schrodinger and his contemporaries did. And the wave equation was realized that it had no physical meaning. The equation is absolutely useless on its own to describe anything, to really represent anything that is reality. In other words, we understand that particles behave like waves, but we didn't think that particles actually moved like that. They just appear as if they move like that and have properties as if they did. So instead of being able to describe the actual position as a function of time, like we can do with real waves, for example, when you have a wave on a string, the particle and the string actually move up and down as the energy moves perpendicular to the motion of the particles. Well, we didn't see that happening with real particles, but yet we had to be able to describe that wave-like property. So we came up with a wave function that had to be complex. So it had to have a real part and an imaginary part and be able to do something with it to be able to turn that into a real quantity representing a real feature of particles. We understood that we can come up with what we call the probability density function. In other words, if you take the wave function and you square it, of course, in order to square it, we have to be able to get rid of the imaginary part. And we can do that by multiplying the function by its complex conjugate, which is simply the same function, but with a negative sign in front of the imaginary part. So when we multiply the two together, the imaginary part disappears. And we then realize that if we square the wave function, we came up with something that represents the probability of where we could potentially find the particle. The higher the function, the higher the probability density function, the more likely you're going to be able to find the particle there. In this example right here, the particle is likely to be there. We can calculate what the probability is for that particle to be there by understanding or calculating the area underneath that probability density curve. Notice you can see that it's much more likely for the particle to be here than it is for it to be there. And you can see that the probability of the particle being in these three locations here is near zero. We also had to have something that could describe the wave function in terms of position. And then we also wanted something that could describe the wave function in, in terms of time. And so going back to the typical equation for wave functions, we knew that it had a concept of kx in there. k is the, the wave number, which is 2 pi over the wavelength lambda. And so the wave function could take on the form of some amplitude times e to the i kx. Remember again that this amplitude is part of a wave function that has no physical meaning. The physical meaning only comes in when we then square the function and get the probability density function. 
So here this should look fairly familiar and then of course if we expand this into the sines and cosines it will of course look like this. It has a real part and an imaginary part. Again, no physical meaning but it represents a function that we see before. If we have a wave function we know that it has an amplitude, a sine or a cosine and then the wave number and then the position x. If we then want to add also the time dependency in there, we have to have the minus omega t. So this kx minus omega t is a very uh, common concept and something we use all the time to describe waves in classical mechanics. So we understood that we have to have some a similar property like that to describe waves in quantum mechanics. Again, to have a wave function, we have to have a real and imaginary part, an amplitude. So the wave function became like this, expanded, it looks like this. If we get rid of the imaginary part, this looks very similar to something you've seen before if you've seen waves in classical mechanics. Also notice that quite often, instead of writing this as the wave function, they pull out a negative sign, switch these two around, and we'll express it like this. And later on it will come quite clear why we do that, because it makes it easier then to represent the wave function in terms of energy and momentum, which is after all the quantities that we use to describe motion and behavior of small quantized particles like electrons and protons. Actually even protons are quite large compared to electrons but for very small particles we definitely want to be able to quantize things and so this was the basis for starting with the concept of an equation that describes the wave-like properties of very small particles. Again, there was no way to actually derive it accurately like we derived some other equations, but at least we drew the concept from wave motion and then we developed it further with making some dangerous analogies between particles and photons. The only way that Schrodinger could then verify that his equation was correct to then experimentally see that the outcome of the experiment matched the outcome of these theoretical equations. And by and large, almost every experiment they did, the experimental data matched the true, or the experimental data matched the equation data. And so there's a lot of confidence that Schrodinger equation does indeed describe the motion of small particles. So if you're interested in this, stay tuned. We'll have lots more videos slowly analyzing, describing this equation, and then finally how to actually use that equation under all the various circumstances, such as wells and barriers and things like that. So we'll get into that in the later videos.